Hi there, I'm Alison Flood and I'm here to chat to Lauren Bukers, author of our latest New Scientist book club pick, Bridge. I've loved Lauren's writing ever since Zoo City won her the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Science Fiction. I've especially enjoyed her blend of science fiction and thriller in books like The Shining Girls, so I was really excited to pick up Bridge, in which Lauren's heroine, Bridge's mother, has just died. But has she really or has she escaped to live in one of the infinite parallel universes that Bridge used to travel to as a child? Lauren and I are going to discuss all aspects of the novel, so I'd advise it's probably best to wait until you've finished it before watching this. But Lauren, hello and welcome. Hi, Alison. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to start by asking, why multiverses? I mean, from like Doctor Strange to everything everywhere all at once, they're so popular these days. Did that put you off in any way? It did worry me. I actually had this idea before the very first Into the Spider-Verse came out. Um, and I was like, oh, no, why have they done this? And of course, you know, Rick and Morty. But I think I think there is a lot of multiverses out there already. Um, you know, literally, if we are to understand quantum physics. Um, but which I don't, which to be clear, I do not. Um, but yeah, I, I think that I was very interested in this, in this idea that we already live in parallel universes. We, you know, like my experience of the world and my experience of reality is so radically different to someone who is a climate change denier or an anti-vaxxer or, you know, a Trump supporter, that it really feels that we're already living in this kind of, you know, schismed world. Um, so I really want to kind of play with that idea I think it's also the idea of all these lives that you haven't lived. So, you know, every choice that you make, every decision path you go down, uh, the things that you did or didn't do, the love affair that you pursued or let walk away, the job you didn't take, um, the connection you didn't make on a train, like all of those could have splintered off into like other versions of you where you would have followed a different path. And it was interesting for me to be able to play with that with a heroine who is very stuck in her life. Um, and quite unlike a lot of my other heroines who've been through a lot of trauma, um, and but they're kind of spiky, fierce protagonists, and Bridge is just flailing because she feels so paralyzed by choice. Sure. I mean, this novel is a coming together of so many different strands. You've got grief as Bridge's mother has just died, friendship, mother and daughter relationships, parasites, harmonics. Was there one particular element which set you off on the pathway to telling this story? Oh, um, I, I think I just had this idea for this kind of weird artifact called a dream worm that would let you switch realities and, and switch with your other self. So it's not, I guess maybe in kind of a freaky Friday or a quantum leap kind of way, you're literally doing a body swap. And so suddenly you swap into someone else's life and they're in yours. And of course, they don't know what the hell is going on. Um, and you get to like experience what it would have, would have been like to be in someone else's life for a little while and see the, the choices that they've made. And sometimes characters use that for more sinister reasons than others. Um, there's a music producer character who's literally stealing songs from his other self. And he's like, well, it's not really plagiarism if I came up with it. <laughs> yeah. But tell us a bit more about the dream worm and how, how you came up with that idea. The bridge finds in her mum's freezer when she's clearing out the house to start with. Yeah. So it's this thing that she remembers from being a child and it's, when you first come across it, it's just absolutely grotesque. It looks like kind of a spindle or a carapace, like wrapped in kind of strands of rotten spaghetti. But as you use it more and more, it starts taking a different aspect where it becomes kind of more like golden threads. Um, and it feels much more attractive, um, which of course is something parasites do, uh, which we can talk about more. I'm very happy to always talk about parasites. Oh, well, tell, us more, tell us more about parasites then and the research that you, you did into that. Oh, so, so much fun. Um, I, yeah, so I had this idea for something called the dream worm. And then I have really amazing scientist friends in Cape Town where I used to live. And um, one of them is Dr. Haley Tomes and she was doing her um, PhD on tapeworm. And, and, and specifically how tapeworm, tapeworm are the leading cause of epilepsy in Africa five to 10 years after infection. But she sat down and she talked me through like all the processes and how they basically mush up the tapeworm and then they use... Um, a confocal microscope to kind of inject a puff of this mush into a slice of right worm brain and to see how it reacts. Um, and it was such a fun day and it was so exciting to like to geek out and like just hang out with scientists and, and talk to these really cool people. And at the end, you know, we've had this whole day in the lab and it's just been like so exciting and so fun, which is verbatim in the book. So if you want to find out about my day in the lab, it's basically the scene with Dom and Tendai. Um, and at the end, Haley said to me, she said, um, well, do you want a slice of rat brain to take home? And I was like, yes, of course I want a piece of rat brain slice to take home. 
And she said, oh, oh, amazing, great. And she was so excited. And she went to go and get me, prepare me a piece of wrap brain slice. And it looks like obviously a desiccated piece of snot on a glass slide, but I brought it across countries with me and it's just been so great to have pinky <laughs> is obviously what I called it, like pinky in the brain. Um, <laughs> so I've got pinky in my you know, cabinet of curiosities, which is this kind of 1930s medical cabinet in my room, along with all the other weird arcana I've collected for, around my books. Um, but it was so fun to geek out. And then Haley sat with me and she like, we worked out plot stuff. We worked out how parasites work. And then I just read a whole bunch of amazing parasite books. My personal favorite parasite is toxoplasmosis. And toxoplasmosis, one Czech researcher believes, might account for uh, more male violence and um, uh, risk-taking behavior. I just love that a parasite could actually affect our ability to engage with the world. But of course, you know, we know that with gut bacteria, you know, there are all kinds of things that are in play in us at all times. And it's just harrowing and weird and incredible. So you got very, very deep into the world of parasites then? Yes, I do. It's not helping my dating life. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, um, am I right in thinking that you moved to London from Cape Town while you were writing Bridge? Yes. So I was in the middle of changing worlds, much like, you know, Bridge is trying to do and, and Joe was doing when she was a little girl was kind of trying out other worlds yeah yeah and um, did that did that feed into the writing I think so you know I think that was also something I've been thinking about for a long time is trying to get my my kids to a place where she could be more part of the world and have more opportunities I also got uh, to interview a lot of neurosurgeons um, and other neuroscientists so Dr. Anil Seth who's written this wonderful book called Being You which is all about consciousness we had a long talk in the middle of the pandemic while I was writing this book over zoom talking about consciousness um, and it was really, it was really cool and exciting. And this book is just mind blowing. Mm. Uh, and then I also spoke to some neurosurgeons in Cape Town, including uh, Dr. Sally Rothermere. And she came and had dinner at my house and we sat and we worked out exactly what uh, Joe's brain tumor was and where it was located. Um, because of course, one of the reasons Joe keeps going to these other universes when Bridge is little is because she's discovered that she has a brain tumor and she thinks that maybe one of her other selves might hold the cure. Um, or know, you know, where it is. And and we discussed, a lot, we got a lot into kind of the um, symptoms of very particular brain tumors. In this particular case, this was a glial tumor. And um, the parts of the brain that it presses on can cause experiences of religiosity. And some people have theorized that's what happened with Joan of Arc um, and people like uh, Hildegard of Bingen, uh, where they're experiencing like these incredible visions and the sense of like just this kind of world that has opened up within them whether that's to God or in Joe's case, to literally other universes. And that's been a big part of Bridges life as well is that, you know, her therapist has helped her understand that her mother was just delusional. She had a brain tumor. She was experiencing these terrible things. Um, but actually now maybe it's, that's not the case at all. Mm. Talk to me about um, the way music is a necessary part of traveling to other worlds and the research that you did into that. The way the dream room works is it takes specific visual cues um, and, uh, and, and music. So that was partly inspired by an amazing radio lab episode on um, uh, bringing gamma back, which is a particular brainwave that they realized that they could um, implant diodes and light diodes into mice and transmit like particular light uh, patterns into mice and reduce Alzheimer. Uh, I think it's called plaque. Hmm. Um, but also music has been used a lot in um, traditions uh, uh, inducing trances. A lot of cultures across the world, going back to ancient times, have used music um, in, ceremon in ceremonies, um, you know, including Christi Christianity. Uh, the organ in a big cathedral or a big church actually plays off subsonics and subsonics are sounds that we can't hear but we do feel inside our bodies and that can create a sense of holiness and transcendence um you know and and so all of that was like really fascinating but i spoke to a whole bunch of music friends uh, in cape town i spoke to mr sakatumi uh, aka sean otum uh, and simon fuzzy ratcliffe and they were already doing amazing work and I, I sat in their studios and we talked through stuff and they played me different things around harmonics a Western understanding of music is, is very codified, and these are the very specific notes. Um, but where you have more resonant instruments, uh, like the sitar um, or the Marib sorry, or the mabira, which is a um, West African instrument, there are kind of resonances which happen between the notes. So I was very interested in this idea of notes between the notes that might open the doors between the worlds. Mm. And 
you know, you have to use the dream worm. It's almost like a communion wafer or a tab of acid. Um, you have to use it at the same time you're playing a particular song and a particular visual, and it's based on an old zoetrope, uh, which is the very old-fashioned animation. And that pattern in the music are the doors. So the dream room is the key, and the pattern in the music are the doors, and that allows you to access universe A or universe ZC or anything else like that. Yeah. So you, you had parasitologists, neuroscientists, music uh, experts, and anywhere else you went with your research that it would be fun to tell us about. Um, I also have a police officer friend, an ex-cop friend in Chicago, um, uh, Joe O'Sullivan, and I found him on Twitter back in the day when I was writing The Shining Girls, and he used to have this Twitter feed called Joe the Cop, where he'd give you like real insight into like what it is to be a police officer. So we talked about bodies, and we talked about, um, you know, how to, how to hide bodies, and he told me about some very gruesome incidences of things that he's dealt with, um, and we also talked about the villain Amber and her police record and what she would and wouldn't have access to. Um, the other very interesting research I did was to Woman in War. Um, and because one of the characters is a, an ex-veteran of, uh, you know, the Gulf War. And I, I read a bunch of books about women's experiences uh, fighting in, particularly in the Gulf War um, and Operation Desert Storm and, you know, other more recent events as well. Mm. And it's just harrowing. It was just absolutely awful. And you, you won't even think about it. You'll stab a child to protect your teammates because that's how you are indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. And those people become everything to you. And I think that really informs kind of where Amber, the villain, is coming from. She's not a nefarious, like, moustache-twirling villain. Like, you can actually kind of understand what she's, where she's coming from. Her methods mm -hmm. are just absolutely horrifying. But you can understand how she got to where she is. Yeah, and that I, was I was going to... I was going to say that uh, she, she, I mean, she's dreadful, obviously, but I kind of loved her as well and her dog, yeah. Mr. Floof, too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, was she a fun character to write? It sounds like fun is the wrong word. Was she an intriguing oh, character to she, write? She was very fun to write, you know, and it was very fun to kind of get into the weirdness of her head. And I think I have written other serial killers in books before. I don't know if she's a classic serial killer, um, but I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not interested in the classic serial killer. So I always try to do something different. I'm really interested in kind of the psychology. And I think I think where Amber is coming from, where so many bad people are coming from, um, is that she feels absolutely justified and she feels righteous and she feels that this is the most important thing that she can do to save the world. And it's not her fault. And, you know, being a monster killer makes you a monster. Mm. And that's all there is to it. And, and so I'm always grappling with aspects of kind of humanity and choice and agency um, and kind of moral responsibility, um, which I think Amber is not doing so great on. Mm. But then I was also entirely wrong footed when Bridge eventually finds her mother, Joe, in another universe. And she and, and me as well suddenly realized that, hey, maybe kicking someone else out of their body to take it over might not be the best thing. Absolutely. You know, so, uh, yeah. So Joe is huge spoilers now, but like Joe has been looking for someone else. Um, you know, she was dying. There was no way is out. And of course, this is also what happened to Amber's friend and why Amber is so very devout um you know a, a, a hunter of people who've used the dream worm um where somebody had stolen her um her army buddy's life uh you know and it was this crazy dictator who um you know, it has to be a version of you but another version of a different reality he was a dictator and he was like being held in prison and tortured every day and he was trying to find a way out and trying to like find another life to steal um, and there are a lot of like really interesting, you know, there's a big issue of consent here. Like this is a non-consensual act and Bridges' best friend Dom is like, dude, this is not okay. Um, because, you know, you can eventually, you know, you can leave notes for the person on the other side and be like, hey, you know, like, thanks for the body swap. Can we do it again sometime? That'd be great. But initially, like people don't know what's happening. They don't know where they are and they don't know, you know, I mean, it's unfathomable. It's inconceivable. Um, so for Joe to have made those decisions and to make these constant incursions into other people's lives, um, and then to have found someone where she's like, well, you don't deserve your life. You know, why, why should you have, why should I be dying? And you're so chronically depressed, you can't leave the house and you're lying there wishing to die. Well, you know, baby, I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it, I think there's a lot of like really interesting like reprehensible questions there mm. um and bridge kind of trying to come to terms with this. this is such a big spoiler um so i really hope people have already read the book we gave uh, a good warning at the beginning yeah, yeah we did absolutely you brought up um, dom i love dom as a character and how um their life is contrasted with bridge who's struggling to work out who she wants to be but dom 
knows exactly who they are. Was that an important point for you to make? It was. I think Dom is one of my favorite characters that I've written. They're just so, you know, they're they're neurotic, but they're also just so kind and compassionate and and fierce. And they really they're very centered in themselves, and they're kind of uh, funny and and they fought really hard to be who they are. Um, so they're non-binary and um, and they're not interested in exploring these other worlds, not just because of consensual issues, but they're like, why I fought so hard for this life hmm. to be who I am. And I went through hell and I went through this whole period where I was just a horrible person on the internet and I was trolling people because I was acting out of anger and fear and rage and I didn't understand who I was. And I've come through all that. So why would I want to go into someone else who's already kind of still maybe dealing with that or hasn't come to terms with exactly who they are? Um, so I think there are this very kind of strong moral center point. Um, mm. And they're just such a goofball. Like, I love them. Um, they're just really lovely. No, they're great. Um, none of the universes that Bridge visits are hugely different from our own. The changes are often quite subtle. Were you not tempted to throw in a few super weird ones? I was, but, um, you know, then then we're getting into, you know, much more kind of weird multiverse stuff. I think I think Amber's experienced some of those, and she's seen what the dream one can do. Um, but for me, it was really much more about, you know, I like... I like using high concepts as a way of exploring kind of very real resonant issues. And as soon as I had like the spider hat version or the talking rocks or a kind of the weird fractal alien intelligence, which reproduces by, I don't know, eating babies, you know, that, that just wouldn't, it would have taken so far away from what I was trying to do, mm -hmm. you know, which is very much this kind of story about like who we are and who we choose to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really important for me. It's really about kind of this weird thing has been introduced and how does it affect this one personal person on like their own journey? Yeah, um, no, yeah. fair. Um, I did love the way uh, that you make us work to find out what's going on. Like uh, after a little while in the, in the book, we suddenly realized that actually maybe Bridge isn't in our world at all. I thought that you did that really well, like the subtle ways that things slipped in. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying. I was trying to be like sneaky, and, and then it's also like a little Easter egg. Like I, I love that as a reader. Where I'm like, oh, I see what you did. Yeah. Nice, nicely done. Our science fiction columnist Sally Addy called Bridge an essential entrant into the multiverse genre because it demonstrates the one crucial flaw in the fantasy: human nature. Is that what you were setting out to do? Always, you know, I'm <laughs> really interested in the ways we just completely stymie ourselves. I think you know that is the story of the world. So storytelling is such an essential part of who we are as humans. I kind of feel like maybe stories are a parasite that are using us as the vector of transmission. Um, Love it. <laughs> but it is like, it's how we understand who we are in the world um, and, and how we'll make ourselves the heroes. Or we'll make ourselves, you know, hard done by and like suffering. And, um, and that's not to like, you know, to mean anybody's actual trauma at all. But, you know, these narratives that we build around ourselves are who we are. And I think it's very much about kind of seizing the story. It's about, as a human being, like that's our essential prerogative is to kind of take charge of the story we tell about ourselves. Um, and that might mean changing things in our life or changing the way we look at things in our life. Um, as much as we can, therapy is wonderful. We should definitely do that. Um, but yeah, I, the problem is that we're all very flawed and we're very egotistical and we're very human and broken and interesting and curious and fun and delightful um, and passionate. Um, and I don't I don't like the philosophies which want everyone to be very kind of calm and just centered and not feel any great passions, because I feel like that's the essential part of being alive, alive is to experience and to feel things. A piece that you wrote for our website, you mentioned that you were diagnosed with ADHD in the process of writing the novel. How did that affect your writing and, and life in general? It's been so interesting because as I said, Bridge is one of my protagonists who is just, she's flailing in her life. She's so paralyzed by choices. She doesn't know who she wants to be. There are all these other lives out there that she could have lived. Um, and I'd, I'd written the book, I was going into final edits and in December, 2020, Two, I went to an ADHD doctor and I got a, an official diagnosis. Um, and it was something I, I think I'd suspected for a long time, but I didn't realize how much it was actually impacting my life, where I felt paralyzed and futile and unable to do very, very simple things. Being on medication and suddenly unlocking this key to my own brain um, to understand like all the challenges I have, but also what makes me, I think, an interesting writer is that I like lots of different shiny things. I'm a magpie. I like to go and follow my curiosities and do these deep dives and fall down rabbit holes about neuroparasitology or musicology. Um, 
And it's been such a gift to actually be able to understand this, to get kind of this instruction manual for your brain, which I think is also a bit of what Joe is trying to do and Bridge is trying to do, like trying to flail around, trying to figure out who she's supposed to be and can't figure out why she can't get to any of these other lives. Mm. Um, so for me, like getting that diagnosis and being uh, on medication has been absolutely life-changing. I feel so much more myself, but I also like talking about it because I found out that I had it because other friends were talking about it. So if me talking about it can unlock it for someone else um, in a way that is so dramatically life-changing where I'm no longer dealing with anywhere near the levels of depression or anxiety, I'm able to get things done. I just feel so much more myself. To be given that gift of understanding who you are is, is amazing. Thank you so much for chatting to us, Laura, and it was so interesting. I wanted to finish by asking, tell us what you're writing at the moment so we can all look forward to that. I have a horror TV show in production. It's an original TV show uh, with some amazing producing partners. Uh, it is currently stalled on the runway because the studios will not meet the demands of the very reasonable demands of the Writers Guild and the Actors Guild strikes. And I'm just starting on a new novel, which is kind of historical. Um, it's going to be set in America in the 40s. And I don't want to talk about it too much because I often find that you can kill the energy of a project. You can talk it to death. Um, and I like to kind of just hold this kind of and nurture this tiny little seedling uh, so until it grows into something and then, then, then stop talking about it. Yeah, excellent. Well, we'll look forward to it, whatever it is when it's ready. Um, it's been so interesting talking, Lauren. Thank you so much for coming in to chat with us. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much.